worst computer f of r. So what does this mean? Well, it's O the f of x for x belonging to r. And, well, this is obviously uh, x squared is always between 0 and infinity. So f of r is going to be in 0 infinity. And we could just say that we can be a little, uh, well, we can say it's equal to uh, just observe that if you have a y in 0 infinity, then <coughs> x squared equal y has two solutions. Uh, plus or minus square root of y, of course. So y uh, belongs to f of r. So this shows the other inclusion, 0 infinity is actually in f of r. So that, that shows that our f of r is exactly 0 infinity. Well, you, you can say by inspection, but yeah, this is simple enough so that I, I understand if you, you thought that you could just give a result and that's it. But that's how you would, you do, you would do it uh, to actually prove it. The second, uh, the second question was to find the inverse image of 0, 1. So is it closed? Um, yeah. Well, this time what we're looking for are uh, all the x's in R so that f of x belongs to 0, 1. So what we're looking for is the solution of a double inequality, x squared between 0 and 1. Well, this happens if uh, and only if x is between minus 1 and 1. OK, so here. Um, you can give as much detail as you want. So this turns out to be exactly minus 1. OK? Now C, f minus 1 of minus 1, 1. Or is it f, f of minus 1, 1? which is all the f of x when x belongs to minus 1, 1. So we look at the squares of uh, numbers in minus 1, 1. Uh, clearly, this is included in 0, 1. because the square of a number between minus 1 and 1 uh, is between 0 and 1. And you can show that the converse uh, holds as well, because if you are going to take a number less than 1 and compute its square root, it's going to be less than 1 as well. So we, we get this equality. Oh, is it the inverse? Oh, OK. OK. 
in that case, what we are looking for are all the x's, so that f of x belongs to minus 1, 1. So we need to solve x squared between minus 1 and 1, which is, of course, the same as x squared between 0 and 1. And x squared is between 0 and 1 uh, if x is between minus 1 and 1. So it turns out that uh, the inverse mean image of minus 1, 1 is actually minus 1, 1. Questions? Okay, uh, second problem. relation between f of a union b and f of a union f of b turns out to be the same thing. Okay? So how do we prove that? Well, if y belongs to f of a union b, this is equivalent to saying that, by definition, that there is x in a union b so that f of x is y. which is the same as saying that either there exists x in A such that f of x is y, or there is x in B such that f of x is y. So either y belongs to f of A, in, if this is the case, or uh, y belongs to f of b, which is the same as saying that y belongs to f of a union f of b. Okay, and so by, by proceeding like this by equivalences, we don't need to prove a double inclusion, we have it uh, uh, at once. On the other hand, f of a union b uh, intersect b is included in f of a intersect f of b, and we'll give a counterexample showing that the inclusion may be strict. And that's also quite easy. If uh, y belongs to f of, well, or can I, well, maybe. If y belongs to f of a intersect b, this means that there exists x in A intersect B so that f of x is y, which means that there exists x in A such that f of x is y, and there exists x in B so that f of x is y. Therefore, yeah, this is where <laughs> I need to be a little careful. So there exists an x in A so that f of x is equal to y. And, but what, what I wrote here is not quite, uh, it's the same x. So I cannot go backwards, uh, or can I? No, here, this, this one is okay. Okay, 
So what I'm saying now is because this is true, then uh, y belongs to f of a intersect f of b. The reason why I cannot come back here is because I'm using the same x. So to belong to f of a intersect f of b means what's written here, but not with the same x. So I shouldn't really, I should, uh, well, it's, it's really this, this line here is really not, not very, is, con is confusing, I think, more than anything else. So anyway, it shows that this guy is included in that one. Yes. Right, but then you need to prove the additional fact that if a, if a is included in B, then f of a is included in f of B. Because that's what you're using. But the main point here is not so much the proofs which are either trivial or you know, just a little tricky to write, is to, to see a little bit what, what the action of f on these different operations and contrast that with the, the action of f minus 1, which is nice somehow. OK, so counter example uh, where we can just take uh, f uh, to be x squared and we can take a to be minus 1, 0, and B to be 0, 1. And uh, if we do f of A is 0, 1, f of B is uh, also 0, 1. And if you do f of A intersect f of B, you get, of course, 0, 1 again. However, A intersect B is the empty set, of course. And therefore, f of a intersect b is the empty set. So that's an example that shows that, in general, the equality does not hold. Now, what about f minus 1? Well, f minus 1 is of a union, is the union of inverse images. So if we have x belonging to f minus 1 of A union B, it means that f of x belongs to A union B, which means that f of x belongs to A or f of x belongs to b, which means that x belongs to f minus 1a, or x belongs to f minus 1b, which means that x belongs to the union f of minus 1a union f of minus 1b. Yes, that's exactly the same argument. Well, except that you are reversing the operation, right? Because when you start with x, you, when you start with y belonging to f of a union b, you are saying that there is an x in a union b, so that f of x is equal to y. I mean, you, the definition of the image, of course, is different. That's why you, you, know, you need to write something different. But it's very similar.
So if we do f minus 1 of A intersect B, we are going to find the same thing. I mean, that it commutes with uh, the sign, and that's because uh, if we have x belonging to f minus 1, A intersect B, this is f of x in A intersect B, which is the same as f of x belongs to A and f of x belongs to B, which is the same as x belongs to f minus 1 A and x belongs to f minus 1 B, which is the same as x belongs to the intersection of these two guys. And that's, that's, it works because now we are looking for one element. It's the same one, so you don't, you don't have a problem you have with, uh, with uh, the direct, uh, with f. Another thing uh, which is useful and that I didn't ask you to do, but we need it, is the following. Uh, f minus 1 of complement of A is actually f minus 1 A complement. Okay, that's an additional property that we need to use. Uh, yes, all this holds for countable unions and intersections. That's right. And we need that, actually. Well, you can, or you, you can just write this. Uh, what, what, I, what I said here, for instance, if we're, we were dealing with a countable intersection, we would say f of x belongs to each one of these guys. Therefore, you know, so it's, it's with the same proof. Seems to work too. There is nothing about countable here that uh, is really used. This one, so if I have x belonging to f minus 1 of complement of A, it means that f of x belongs to the complement of A, which means that f of x does not belong to A. Let's see. And if I take f of x, x belonging to f minus 1, A complement, what does it mean? It means that uh, x, well, x does not belong to f minus 1 of A. And that's the same thing as saying that f of x does not belong to A. Because if f of x belongs to A, by definition, x belongs to f minus 1 of A. So you see that belonging to this guy or belonging to this one gives me the same condition. Therefore, they are the same. Okay, then there was this other if we assume that the series is finite then <coughs> excuse me, new of link sub of E N is So how do we prove that? Well we write down what Limsup is. We 
which is this guy. And then we call this guy Fn. And we observe again that Fn is a decreasing sequence. And therefore, uh, we can pass to the limit, provided we, we know that the measure of uh, F1 is finite. So what is F1? F1 is the union over all of them. And mu of F1 is less than the sum of the mu of E k's, which is finite. So we know that mu of F1 is finite. Because of that, because it's decreasing and the mu of the first one is finite, we can say that the limit of mu of Fn is mu of the intersection of Fn, which is exactly mu of limsop of Fn. Okay. Now, uh, my problem is to show that this side is zero, because then I'm done. So what I do is I estimate this side, and Fn is this. So again, I use the same inequality, and I say that mu of Fn is less than the sum from k bigger than n of mu of e k. Okay, I have equality when my sets are disjoint, and I have an inequality when, they, when I have no information. So in this case, I cannot say it's equal, but I can say it's less than the sum. Now, this is the tail of a convergent series, so it has to go to zero. How do you prove that? Well, you, you just write it. So let's see. We can. So let. Sn be the sum from 1 to n of mu of ek. And we know that Sn converges to the infinite series. And I'm going to call this guy S. OK, it's, uh, it's a finite limit because I know it's finite. But in, in, in any case, because in, in uh, this class I'm working with infinity, I would have no problem just saying that, uh, uh, well, I, this symbol is always well defined because it could be infinity. But I'm talking about uh, uh, an increasing sequence, so that's fine. OK, it's, I know that uh, any increasing sequence is either has a finite limit, like in this case, or uh, is not bounded, but uh, to talk about the infinite sum is meaningful. Uh, only because my terms are all positive, of course. If not, uh, then I don't know. OK, so I have this. So let's write convergence. We know that for every epsilon, there exists an n, so that if n is bigger than capital N, then uh, Sn minus S is less than epsilon. But if you do Sn minus S, you get this guy. OK, you are just subtracting the first n terms, so you get this. Well, of course, you don't need the absolute value. Everything is positive. So what you are showing is that for every epsilon, this thing here is less than epsilon. So. This goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Now, you need to be careful in these inequalities. In this case, I know that the limit exists. Because that's part of a property, fn is a decreasing sequence. So I can just pass to the limit on both sides. Because I know that this limit exists as well. 
Okay? So from here, I just say, well, limit of mu of fn is less than limit of this thing here. And this turns out to be 0, as I just proved. Okay? And so mu, the limit of mu of fn is less than 0. Because mu of fn is a positive number, the limit is necessarily, so the limit of mu of fn is necessarily 0, which was what I wanted. Okay? It's what I wanted because now I have 0 on this side and I have mu of limb sub of en equal to 0, which is exactly my conclusion. Okay, I'm done. Uh, on the homework, I saw that several of you, uh, they had one, you had one limit on one side. On the other side, you didn't know whether you had a limit or not. And you used limit anyways. You cannot do that. That's why you have lim inf and lim sub. You can always use the, your lim inf if you, if you don't know that the limit exists. Or you can use the lim sub, depending what whatever is better. What you cannot do is say, well, my limit is less than my lim inf and, you know, and work with a limit. No, you can only work with a limit if your limit exists. Yes? Uh, well, but what I'm saying is that in general, if, if, I, if I'm given a sequence of events EN, of uh, sets EN, then mu of EN does not necessarily have a limit. Well, yes, but what I'm saying is that you cannot use this symbol unless you have some reason. You, you can justify the existence. What you can do is say, is work with lim inf of mu n uh, or lim sub of mu of n. What you cannot is work with limit of mu of n because this may very well not exist. Okay, so this is uh, an interesting result. Uh, as I told you, very useful in probability. And it, so it tells us what? Well, we know that to belong to lim sub means that you belong to infinitely many, uh, infinitely many sets en. So when you prove such a thing, it means that for almost, so the way you would write this is that for almost every x, or almost every x belongs to finitely many ends. Okay, that's that's what we use. The almost meaning that the measure is zero. or that the measure of a complement of this event is zero. So we come back to this. In probability, it's easier to say because you say that something happens almost surely. So here we would say that almost surely uh, there are X belongs to finitely many E's. Questions on this problem? Okay, so that's it for the homework, right? Okay, so let's see.
so last time we talked about continuity and, and uh, we, we defined continuity using uh, the inverse image of open. We say that the function is continuous if and only if every inverse image of uh, an open is open. And we are going to see that measurable is very much alike, except that you are going to require that every uh, inverse image of an element of uh, the, the image uh, sigma algebra is in the, 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 the sigma algebra of origin. So let's do that. So we take a function f from x with a sigma algebra a into uh, y with a sigma algebra m. And we say that f is measurable. And really, we should say f is a m measurable, just to, to specify with which sigma algebras we are referring to, if and only if for every B in M, we have F minus 1 of B is in A. So it's very similar to what we how we define continuity, okay? You take the inverse image of your n sigma algebra and you need to find that it's in this sigma algebra. Of course, this, this is clearly depending on what your sigma algebras are, okay? Now, the, the standard, and 99% of the time that's what we'll be thinking of, the standard case is the following one. is f going from xA to Rb, where B is the Borel sigma algebra. OK, so that's our main case. We are thinking about a numerical function, function that have value in R, and we are thinking about the Borel sigma algebra for this guy. Here it doesn't matter. We don't know. It's something mysterious. It may many different possibilities. But on the end part, it's going to be RB. OK. Uh, yeah, a very important uh, property. So you see it's uh, the task here may look a little daunting because uh, sigma algebras are quite big. I mean, a Borel sigma algebra has a lot in it. So if we need to check for every possibility, we are not going to prove that anything is measurable. It's going to be a nightmare. We are saved because it's enough to prove this property, not for the whole sigma algebra, but just for something that generates the sigma algebra. Okay? So for open sets, for instance, in the case of a Borel sigma algebra. So that's what we're going to state now.
uh, assume that, so we have same setting, x, uh, I said what, x a, y m, and let, and assume that the smallest sigma algebra generating by some subset E is M. Then F is measurable. <coughs> if and only if F minus 1 of B belongs to A, for all B in E. Okay, so instead of looking at all the inverse images, you look only at the inverse images of this sub thing, the thing which is inside your sigma algebra. Okay, so E is a nice part of your sigma algebra. It's the open sets, for instance, in the case of Borel, or the closed sets, or you know, we have these uh, 30 possibilities for what generates uh, uh, Borel sigma algebra. So how do we prove that? <coughs> well, one, one, one implication, of course, is clear. If your function is measurable, then f minus 1 of b must belong to a because uh, e must be, e, e, of course I should have said this somewhere, so e is in m. So, of course, if you take your b in e, then f minus 1 of b must be in a. So, there is nothing to prove for the direct implication, it's a triviality. Now, what's interesting is the reverse implication. So, assume this. And then define C to be over B's in Y such that M minus 1 of B belongs to A. Okay, so you look at your, at all the possible subsets in Y whose inverse image is in, are in the right place. We're going to show that, first step, we're going to show that C is a sigma algebra. Well, how do I know that C is not empty? That's the first step, right? I, I don't want uh, an empty sigma algebra. How do I know that uh, C is not empty? Well, if I do F, I need to do F minus 1 of a trivial set. That's all. So I could do F minus 1 of the empty set and say it's empty, and therefore that's in C, and C is not empty because the empty set is in it. Okay, so f minus one. So uh, the empty set is clearly in Y, and f minus one of the empty set is necessarily empty. So the empty set belongs to C, which therefore is not the empty set. If you don't like this example, we can do something else. We can say, well. Uh, the whole y is in y. And f minus 1 of y, what's f minus 1 of y? It's x, right? I have a function from x to y. Okay, so all of x is f minus 1 of y, and x therefore belongs to c. 
And these are two things that I always have in my sigma algebra. The empty set and the whole set are in any sigma algebra. Otherwise, it's not a sigma algebra. OK, so first step. Now, second step, let's take a union. Let's take a sequence EI in C. And then let's look at F minus 1 of the union of EIs. And we know that F minus 1 can commute with uh, union. So we have this. And now each one of these guys is in C by definition. Uh, is in A by definition. Right? That's the definition of being in C, is that your inverse image is in A. And now you are doing the union of things in A, you are therefore in A. Okay? Because A is a sigma algebra. So this thing here is in A. So C is stable under union. And the last step is to check that C is stable under complement. So we take E in C. And we look at f minus 1 of E complement. And we say this is f minus 1 of E complement. But f minus 1 of E is in A. So the complement is also in A, because A is a sigma algebra. So complement of E is also in C. Therefore, I check that my C is actually a sigma algebra. Okay? So C is a sigma algebra. Then, second step, E is included in C. Therefore, M of E is included in C. Why? Why is it true that if I look at the small sigma algebra generated by E, I get C. I, uh, I am also included in C. Why is that true? That's our lemma, right? Remember that lemma? Okay, if your E is in sigma algebra, then the small sigma algebra generated by your E is also in the same sigma algebra. That's why it's important to prove first that C is a sigma algebra. Otherwise, you don't have this property. OK? So this is true by a lemma we use several times. And it's true because since C is a sigma algebra. But now we know our assumption was M of E is M. So the whole sigma algebra M is included in C. But to be in C means precisely to have an inverse image in A. OK? So now you take any B in M, we have that B belongs to C, which means that F minus 1 of B is in A. So by definition, F is measurable with respect to A and M, and we are done. Questions? OK. So. Do we agree that M is in C? Okay. So now I'm going just I'm going to write down what it means for M to be in C. Um, I take any B in M, then it must be in C. But my definition of C 
is to have the inverse image belonging to A. So that's what I write here, f minus 1 of B belongs to A. But that's exactly the definition of being measurable. Because I took any one in M, and I saw that its inverse image was in A. And that's how I define to be measurable. So I'm done. That's a very important uh, property, because we are going to use it all the time. Okay? We are never going to check that uh, f minus 1 of b belongs to uh, a for all b's. We are going to check that for a subset of the b's. So, uh, since we're talking about that, uh, the application, the corollary of that is that we have f going from x a into y, uh, no, it's not y, it's r now, rb. Okay, so this is for, for the Borel sigma algebra we're going to use B. So uh, F is Borel measurable. The French say Borelian. But I don't know. Anyway, so it's uh, Borel measurable. If and only if one of the following is true, f minus 1 of a positive infinity belongs to a for every a. Maybe I shouldn't use a. Can you see the difference with, between my little a and my beautiful calligraphical a? Yes? OK. so. f minus 1 of uh, a close positive infinity belongs to a for every a in R. This is enough. Then we can do things with negative infinity. Okay, so you can check only one of these properties to have that it's a Borel measurable function. And why? Well, because uh, for I, for instance, what you would take for your E is the set of A positive infinity for A belonging to I. And you know that M of E is B. So if you check that f minus 1 of these guys are in the right place, you are done. OK, for 2i, you'll take these sets here and so on. So it's a direct application of what we just did. It's very useful. So what's the relation between measurable and continuous? Measurable seems to be a little big. I mean, you, you are taking, you know, you're not asking much. Uh, continuous is more strict. 
So one should be included in the other, and that's indeed the case. So what do we, uh, yeah. OK. Uh, so assume that our f goes from x with a Borel measure on x. So x needs to be a topological space so that we can talk about open sets. And then the open sets generate your Borel sigma algebra in x. It's not necessarily R, although you know most of the time it will be R. It goes to Y, same thing with BY. So this is the Borel sigma algebra on Y. Then if F is continuous, then F is Borel measurable. The proof is very easy. I just take E to be all the open sets of what? Take Q to belong in E, so it's an open set. Then f minus one of u. Uh, well, before. So if u belongs to E, then u of course belongs to by because it's a Borel set since it's open. And if u belongs to by, then. Uh, now, why do I want to do that? I was thinking precisely, maybe today I don't need a break, but uh, maybe I do. OK, so U belongs to E, and we are using continuity. Yeah. OK, so U belongs to E. Therefore, F minus 1 of U is open. If it's open, then it means that F minus 1 of U belongs to Bx. OK, so any inverse image of an element of E is in Bx. But of course, the sigma algebra generated by E is Bx. So again, by the proposition we proved, this shows that F is measurable. Right? I'm sorry? Um, looking, uh, actually, it's M of E, thank you, it's M of E equal to BY, that's what I need. Because I'm looking at the open sets of BY. Yeah, what the proposition looks at is something that generates the sigma algebra in Y. So that's what we have.
Okay, maybe we should stop now 10 minutes and then we'll come back to it. <laughs>